Thank you so much for inviting me, um, giving me the opportunity to present my work. Um, I did this work about uh, a little over a year ago, and I learned a lot during the process. And I'd like to share this experience with all of you. Before I start, I disclose that I have a research grant from International Net Council Research and Education Foundation. But the founder has no role in any aspect of the study um, because we are protected by the institution and uh, uh, the founder has no uh, uh, say in the data analysis or interpretation. So when we talk about nuts, we usually refer to tree nuts and peanuts. Uh, but technically, peanuts is not, uh, are not nuts. They are legumes. But because their nutritional profile are very similar, uh, in most of the studies, they were grouped together. And in at most of the FFQs, they were asked as one question. In the, in the US, the top three uh, tree nuts consumed are almonds, walnuts, and pistachios. Um, hazelnuts is also very popular in Europe. And actually, in the Predimat that I mentioned in the morning, they randomized a mix of nuts, and they, uh, they include uh, almonds, uh, walnuts, and hazelnuts. So nuts uh, have always been uh, very special in nutritional research because nuts are rich in all kinds of bioactive uh, com com compounds and nutrients. And it was uh, nuts are rich in uh, unsaturated fatty acids, all kinds of minerals, vitamins, polyphenols, and other phytochemicals. And a lot of small clinical trials have shown that nuts have uh, beneficial effects. Um, these components, for example, unsaturated fatty acids, have uh, a, a great effect on lowering the cholesterol level. And one of the um, famous study, done by Dr. Sabetti here, um, is uh, he basically did a meta-analysis of these 25 feeding trials on nuts and uh, cholesterol. Uh, uh, lipids, blood lipids, um, uh, and then uh, the, he, 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 as you can see here, there's a dose-response relationship between nuts and the level, blood level of lipids. The more nuts you cons one consume, the, the uh, more reduction that we observe in the uh, blood lipids, uh, with blood lipids. And other uh, um, p potential mechanisms include uh, uh, all these uh, different uh, minerals, antioxidants in nuts have effects on lowering the uh, reduced uh, inflammation, oxidative stress, and uh, they also reduce insulin resistance in some studies. And these mechanisms play an uh, important role in most of the uh, chronic diseases, uh, for example, hypertension um, and uh, uh, hypoglycemia and diabetes and some t in some cases, cancer. So uh, with all this, oh, actually, um, some study also show that uh, nuts have an effect on, uh, on the re reduced obesity. Um, and one, this, uh, one of the study done in nurses and health professionals uh, at Harvard is uh, basically they look at the association between nut consumption over 30 years and um, the weight change over 30 years. And they observed the uh, in, uh, strong inverse association with nuts. So the more nut you observe, actually you lose more weight, which is uh, contrary to the common perception. So with all these benefits, uh, with different components in nuts, and also the, based on the small clinical trials um, uh, on the uh, nuts and the biomarkers, we hypothesize that the uh, long-term regular nut consumption have a beneficial effect on, uh, well, have, is associated with reduced total mortality and reduced mortality due to heart disease. And so we use the uh, nurses' health study and health professional follow-up study, and these are well-known, well-established studies. They are prospective, uh, so we can establish the temporal relationship. Uh, they have large sample size. 
um, they are actually uh, one of the largest cohorts in the world. And, and they, uh, particularly in dietary analysis, these cohorts have uh, great uh, strengths because they measure the dietary intake every, four, every two to four years. This repeated measurement is crucial for dietary analysis because we, we are more interested in the long-term consumption. And long-term consumption is more relevant to the disease outcome. And also in these studies, we, uh, we, were, we were able to separate uh, peanuts from tree nuts, uh, which is not very, very common uh, among all the other uh, cohort studies. And as, like I said, every two to four years, we send questionnaires to the participants, ask about their dietary and lifestyle factors. And uh, they, uh, we did a small uh, uh, validation study and show uh, the FFQ, uh, even the baseline FFQ works uh, fairly well. And for the outcome, we also uh, uh, have a validation study show the outcome assessment is, uh, 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 is accurate. And also, uh, we, we collected all this uh, covariate information over 30 years, uh, including uh, the basic uh, uh, geographic information and also uh, some, some of the factors uh, are not very commonly asked in other cohort studies, for example, physical exam and family history of all kinds of diseases, uh, diseases such as diabetes, uh, cancer, and heart disease, and a, a lot of uh, detailed uh, assessment uh, on a variety of covariates. Um, this is also important because uh, with all the dietary factors, it, um, uh, people al always have doubts on yeah, epidemiologic studies because, uh, because of confounding by, by all these variables. So have all this avail uh, information available is very important. So we, later on, we can do all kinds of analysis to try to uh, assess the, uh, uh, to do uh, sensitivity analysis to, to assess the robustness of our estimate. And we also did some baseline exclusions. And after exclusion, we have around 120,000 people in the study. And this is a baseline uh, uh, population characteristics. And as you can see here, people who consume more nuts are um, more, have, have healthier lifestyles. They are less likely to be smokers, and they exercise more. They consume more fruits and vegetables, uh, but they also drink more. Um, but uh, fortunately, we have collected all this information so we can adjust for them later on. And this is uh, uh, one of the uh, main analysis. So for, for the whole nut analysis, we see a, a strong inverse association between nut consumption and total mortality. And this inverse association is primarily driven by cardiovascular disease, particularly heart disease. And as you can see, oh, as you can see here, um, so for, for those who consume nuts more than five times per week, uh, we observed a 29% uh, reduction in, uh, in, cardiac, uh, in heart disease over 30 years. And, uh, but for stroke, uh, we actually didn't see any association. Overall, for cardiovascular disease, we, we, see, uh, we saw 25% reduction over 30 years. And this, uh, this analysis when we uh, separate uh, peanuts from tree nuts. And as you can see here, uh, for, uh, we, we, for, for example, heart disease, we see similar effects uh, between peanuts and tree nuts here as well. Women, this man, women and this man, and this is combined. And um, uh, this is a total mortality, and this is heart disease. And, you, and it, 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 it's very obvious that these associations are primarily driven by heart disease. Uh, the confidence intervals are very uh, narrow, and, uh, um, and the, uh, the, the association is, uh, is very strong. Uh, inverse association is pretty strong. And this is analysis, that, uh, sensitivity analysis that I just talked about. So basically, we look at this association in different subgroups by age, by uh, BMI, physical activity, and all these variables that I, uh, I just mentioned, um, uh, physical exam. So it doesn't matter whether uh, what your BMI is or whether you exercise more on, or not. Um, nuts uh, have uh, this uh, inverse association with total mortality. And this is true for heart disease as well. 
So, uh, and then we did this sensitivity analysis, exclude smokers and uh, people with extreme BMIs, and they exclude diabetics and uh, adjusted for Mediterranean diet because uh, it's, sometimes people always wonder whether it's dietary pattern or nuts. So we try to do the best we can. Uh, since we have this information, we further adjusted for Mediterranean diet. And also because of the results from Pranimad uh, study, we also adjusted also further adjusted for olive oil intake. And we also did this lag analysis, two-year lag analysis, and none of this analysis have any impact on the results. So um, basically, our, uh, in this large cohort studies, nursing health study and health professional follow-up study, we observed this uh, inverse association between us and total mortality, and uh, uh, particularly heart disease. Um, we didn't observe a strong association with stroke. Uh, we, we, we tried every possible way to reduce confounding to address uh, all the uh, biases that, uh, po that, that's possible to occur. But there's one, and we did a good job, and uh, it got published um, uh, very quickly. Um, but uh, there's one limitation that um, people always criticize nurses and health professionals, those two cohorts. Uh, they always say uh, your cohorts are um, primarily whites and uh, uh, with, uh, com comprised of people with higher social status because they are health professionals. And, and this uh, comments we it's very it's impossible for us to address. So we uh, we definitely admit that we uh, the, 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 uh, this generalizability is one of the limits that our study have. Uh, this study just published last month, um, the May 5th, I think, and this study, is, they did exactly the same thing, even for the subgroup analysis, sensitivity analysis, they basically repeated our analysis by using different cohorts. So these two cohorts, uh, actually four cohorts, uh, three cohorts. So one, oh, the first one is the Southern Community Cohort Study, and they recruited people only from low, uh, with, with low <coughs> social status. And uh, this Shanghai study uh, basically done in Asian, uh, Asia. Um, so, in, in, as you can see, the in this uh, in this uh, southern community cohort study with people with low uh, social status, they observed very similar uh, results as our study. So, for cardiovascular disease, they see uh, in, among African Americans, uh, they see about 23 percent reduction uh, in uh, in mortality. And uh, in uh, European descent, uh, uh, and then they see uh, probably 38% uh, uh, reduction. And then for heart disease, a stronger effect, uh, just like our results see more uh, reduction with heart disease. Um, and for stroke, um, both types, they didn't see, uh, even though they um, suggested inverse for uh, ischemic uh, stroke, but then the results are not significant. And uh, uh, but for for the uh, Shanghai cohorts, they observed strong, uh, so very similar results uh, as this uh, this cohort and our cohorts. And then for heart disease, stronger effect. Um, but they do see a significant uh, uh, inverse association with stroke. But then the uh, estimates are only borderline significant. So uh, I think this, this study is very important. It's a great contribution to the field because um, obviously uh, uh, nurses and health professionals have a very large sample and well designed, but uh, this study just uh, look at the association about, uh, uh, you know, in a different type of uh, uh, population and they make the story more complete, the big picture more complete. And the story, um, uh, it's, it's basically, uh, they, uh, it's, um, the associ inverse association between nuts and cardiovascular mortality are consistent across different type of uh, different racial groups, and uh, um, is consistent uh, among uh, people with high or low uh, social status. So, to this date, um, there are ten studies, cohort studies, uh, on nuts and cardiovascular mortality. Earlier studies are smaller, uh, of shorter duration. Uh, later studies, oh, later studies um, are larger and uh, with a longer uh, follow-up uh, with nurses, like uh, 30 years, the longest uh, follow-up. And uh, uh, you can see here the um, 
the, uh, the, the, these studies uh, across U uh, US, Europe, and Asia. And uh, uh, except for nurses, um, the other studies used the baseline questionnaire, just one single questionnaire. But anyway, they got uh, similar results. Um, and uh, they, um, all these studies adjusted for age, gender, smoking, BMI, and physical activity, and some of the dietary factors. So uh, the, these studies are all uh, well conducted. So I did this meta-analysis um, a few weeks ago and just to see the uh, overall effect of uh, association between nuts and cardiovascular mortality. Uh, and you can see the, um, the association are uh, fairly consistent across these 10 studies. Um, and the summary estimate uh, is about 0.73. Uh, uh, so it's, it's very uh, similar to what what, uh, what we found and uh, what in the um, in the in that uh, uh, the study that I just mentioned, and the, and the um, point estimates are consistent across different studies. And this this analysis, uh, basically, I uh, omitted one study at one time just to see whether uh, the summary uh, estimate is uh, influenced by a single study. And uh, when I did this, um, and you see, it, it's basically deleting one study has an absolutely very little effect on the summary estimate. And no matter which study you delete, um, the summary estimate, uh, the upper bound of confidence interval is still is less than 0.8. So um, it's just another way to show that the uh, results are very consistent across studies. And I did the same thing for, cardio, uh, for heart disease. Uh, and then uh, these 10 studies um, show very uh, consistent findings uh, regarding uh, nuts and uh, heart disease uh, mortality. And uh, uh, the summary estimate uh, is about 0.69. And I did the um, uh, sensitivity analysis as well. And similar findings, so uh, the the, the result, overall results are not is not influenced by any single study. And the uh, no matter which study you delete, the upper bound is about 0.78. So very strong. Well, in terms of dietary analysis, uh, this should consider should be considered a very strong association, immersive association. Um, but uh, let's look at stroke. So there are uh, the, uh, six, uh, well, should be five studies uh, looked at stroke. Um, so um, it's compared to heart, cardiovascular disease and heart disease, uh, the results are less consistent. You can see some in one study uh, in this one type of stroke has actually increased the risk. Um, but the summary estimate is still inverse. Uh, it looks inverse. The confidence interval is not as uh, narrow as before uh, because of the small sample size. And also, uh, it's much closer to one. And when I uh, did this sensitivity analysis, um, and you can, uh, it's obvious that the, the summary uh, estimate is highly influenced by the Shanghai cohorts, uh, just as I mentioned before. Uh, the, in the Shanghai cohorts, they, uh, they observed the uh, inverse association with stroke, but uh, uh, it's borderline significant. But if we delete this study from the uh, meta-analysis, the results are not, no longer significant. The upper bound of the confidence intervals is, is about 1.06. Uh, so, um, Basically, um, with, uh, for cardiovascular disease and heart disease, we can conclude with confidence that there's association, inverse association. But for stroke, I think the evidence is not as strong. And uh, if we do a meta-analysis, you can see only one study really uh, stand out, but the other study is um, inconclusive or inconsistent across studies. So for um, this is uh, just, uh, I always think that the, for epidemiologic studies, people always worry about uh, association, whether the association is causation. But as epidemiologists, we do uh, the best we can based on the current uh, available evidence. And so I basically apply the, um, the uh, 
uh, nine-point Hill criteria to, to see whether the, this observed association uh, is likely to be causal or not. So uh, let's say one by one. Um, in terms of strength of the association for dietary analysis, I think it's pretty uh, strong uh, for, for uh, cardiovascular disease and heart disease. For stroke, it's less strong, but also still inverse. Um, for cardiovascular disease and heart disease, uh, the results are very consistent across different studies. Um, but for stroke, uh, it's another story. Um, in terms of temporal uh, reality, uh, because all these 10 studies are prospective cohort studies, so uh, dietary measurement occurred before the outcome, so we don't have any uh, worry uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, which comes first. And uh, in terms of coherence, as I showed the subgroup analysis and also uh, uh, the, the Shanghai cohort, European cohort, and all show similar effect and different ratio groups, uh, different regions, and also because the biomarkers, I, uh, biomarker studies I mentioned before in the beginning, um, that nuts uh, and all the components have all this effect on, uh, on different kind of biomarkers in small clinical trials, uh, which uh, uh, shows the our finding and uh, the observation from the cohort studies is consistent with. Uh, uh, the biomarker studies also add evidence to the coherence, this criteria. Okay, uh, and then um, all, all these associations have those response relations. Um, and then uh, uh, e even though it's not, not specific to cardiovascular disease, this is a weaker criteria and, and uh, because the biomarker studies has credible uh, biological mechanisms behind this association. Um, so if, if you judge by the nine point criteria, uh, the, 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 association, the, the association between nuts and cardiovascular disease, heart disease, are uh, fulfilled most of the uh, criteria, uh, except for the experiment uh, the part, because we don't, to this date, we don't have a clinical trial uh, on nuts and the heart, uh, heart disease, the heart clinical outcome, because those studies will be very time consuming and expensive. Um, but then we have PREDIMED, uh, even though it combined um, Mediterranean diet with nuts, but still uh, it lends some uh, evidence to the, immersive, uh, to the uh, uh, causal uh, effect <coughs> for nuts, um, even, though, even though it's combined with Mediterranean diet. So uh, in conclusion, um, all this, with all this evidence, we can conclude with confidence that nuts, nut consumption uh, is associated with uh, reduced uh, total mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality, especially for heart disease mortality. And, but the evidence for stroke is less consistent, um, is, but suggestive. Thank you. Thanks to the organizers of this symposium, Dr. Uh, Cyril Kendall and John Stephen Piper, for inviting me to this uh, very nice congress uh, held in this always friendly uh, city of Toronto. Oops. Okay. So here you have my potential conflict of interest. My institution has received some funding for research from the ANC. And uh, also uh, part of this, uh, the results that I will show you were funded by American Pistachios Growers and Paramore Farm. Uh, but anyway, uh, all of them have been already published, so they were submitted to a peer review. I think it's not necessary to convince anybody in this forum that type 2 diabetes is one of the major public uh, burden, global burden worldwide. Uh, because its prevalence, the incidence, and also because the economic uh, cost, the associated economic cost. And probably for the reason, uh, any strategy focused on both the prevention and the management of this pathology will be welcome. Uh, some years ago, Mediterranean diet 
emerged as a healthy dietary pattern, but not only for cardiovascular outcomes, but also for type 2 diabetes, as in fact has been uh, widely discussed this, this morning in this uh, same room. So from the PREDIMED uh, study, what we observed was that those subjects uh, following a Mediterranean diet supplemented with olive oil or a Mediterranean diet supplemented with nut had a lower risk to develop type 2 diabetes. But I'm not talking again uh, about a Mediterranean diet. I only focus my next 15 minutes, more or less, in a key food from the Mediterranean pyramid. I'm talking about uh, nuts. Why nuts? Well, as everybody knows, nuts are energy-dense foods. Uh, mostly uh, of them are made of uh, fatty acids, but most of the fatty acids that nuts contain are polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids. So are we talking about uh, healthy fatty acids? There was a, a discussion this morning about this. But also nuts has uh, or is um, a matrix of uh, mineral components not less important. I'm talking about antioxidants, polyphenols, also fiber. So um, I thought uh, we don't know now yet the exactly mechanism by which these uh, components of nuts could uh, play a role in diabetes, we suggest that some of them, for example, magnesium or, or well, we not suggest, we know that, because it has been uh, already demonstrated by other authors, that all of, uh, some of them uh, can play a role regulating uh, postprandial glucose clearance or uh, improving pancreatic secretion or also decreasing insulin resistance. But what are the observational studies telling us? So if we go back to the preliminary trial in a cross-sectional assessment, we demonstrate in our group that uh, those subjects uh, who, uh, in, who intake more than three servings per week of nuts had a higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes. However, we failed to find a higher uh, prevalence of um, high fasting plasma glucose, uh, taking into account the cut of values uh, used by the definition of metabolic syndrome. But what's going on with the longitudinal studies? So in contrast to those uh, reported before by Dr. Yibao uh, 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 regarding cardiovascular outcomes, the evidences in type 2 diabetes are less clear and a little bit inconclusive. So from all the studies, whereas three of them reported a negative association between nut consumption and the incidence of type 2 diabetes, uh, the other two uh, didn't report any significant association or even a significant higher risk to develop type 2 diabetes. So looking at this, uh, these results, uh, a question is coming to my mind. So maybe there is a difference between men and women because in NASA's health study one, in the, in the NASA's health study uh, two, they found significant association. Anyway, <coughs> last year, in 2014, a series of meta-analyses were published in the same journal, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And if we have a look to the results, are really um, interesting because whereas the first one couldn't find any significant relationship between nut consumption and uh, the incidence of type 2 diabetes. The second one showed a non-significant trend to a beneficial role of nuts. And the third one significantly demonstrated that there was a um, relationship, a prevention, uh, regarding nuts on, on type 2 diabetes. More recently, two months ago, in March 2015, if I'm not wrong, uh, there, was, there, there is another uh, publication regarding the relationship between nuts and the, in, the, the relation, the effect of nuts on the incidence of type 2 diabetes. This was uh, conducted in the EPIC cohort, and once again, they couldn't find, I'm not sure if I have a pointer here, they couldn't find any significant association. They were, there was a trend, but they couldn't find any significant association between nut consumption and seeds, in this case, uh, and uh, the incidence of type 2 diabetes. So, uh, okay. What are the clinical trials are telling us? So, have a look. We can divide clinical trials in clinical trials at short term and clinical trials, trials at long term. What's happened what happened at uh, short term? What's going on with the acute feeding clinical trials? We have different uh, studies. 
conducted in different uh, type of subjects, healthy or type of diabetes, at different uh, age, and giving different type of, uh, of, na of uh, nuts. But all of them agreed in a lowering effect of nuts, lowering uh, glucose and insulin, lowering effect of nuts. So that's good. But what happened with the longitudinal, with the middle uh, term or long term clinical trials? Five years ago, we conducted a study on this <coughs> issue in our, in our group. We designed a, random, a parallel uh, study conducted in metabolic syndrome, so uh, 50 subjects who were randomly allocated to a diet, uh, including a mix of uh, walnuts, hazelnuts, and, uh, and almonds, and another group free of nuts. And what we found at the end of the follow-up, after 12 weeks of uh, intervention, what we found was a significant reduction in the nut diet group, a significant reduction of insulin and uh, HOMA insulin resistance. So, looking at these results, we could say that nuts are working uh, in the decrease of uh, insulin and uh, insulin and, uh, and the improvement of insulin resistance. But there are, of course, other studies in the in the literature. Uh, I I left some of them, not uh, too much, but some of them are not in this table. If we have a look again, we have different studies, again, of course, <coughs> with different design, crossover, or uh, sometimes uh, parallel studies conducted on different uh, populations, on different subjects. Some of them were healthy, obese, or type 2 diabetes, or even pre-diabetic subjects, with a length of uh, coming from four weeks to, um, I don't remember the, 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 the longest, but maybe 60 weeks, huh? in different number of subjects, giving different type of um, of nuts and leading different type of results. So whereas some of them couldn't find any effect, any beneficial effect, not deleterious as well, any beneficial effect of nuts on glucose and insulin metabolism, others reported a down lowering glucose and insulin effect of nuts. In the best of my knowledge, at the moment, there is only one uh, published uh, meta-analysis of clinical trials uh, trying to assess the uh, effect of nuts on diabetes. Diabetes, in this case, is in the control of diabetes. This uh, study was conducted here in Toronto, led by Dr. Cyril Kendall and also uh, John Stephen Piper. And if you have a look to this, uh, to this um, uh, graph, what we can see is that uh, the total, um, so um, nuts had a, provokes a, a, dec a decrease in uh, hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobin A1C, meet, mm, meaning that a better improvement of type 2 diabetes. They also found a significant decrease of glucose, fasting glucose uh, plasma levels, and a non-significant trend to a lower, uh, a decrease of insulin uh, plasma levels. And at least in my knowledge, there is nothing else relating nuts and uh, type 2 diabetes or glucose and insulin metabolism. Now I'm moving to a, a one study, the, the last study that's, uh, that uh, we conducted in our unit on this issue. But we were aware about not the treatment of diabetes, but probably the prevention of diabetes. As you know, it's quite difficult to conduct a, a study on the prevention of any uh, disease. So uh, we were interested in, um, I mean, when diabetes is knocking our door, so in the pre-diabetic state, status. As you know, pre-diabetic status is also a metabolic derangement and is maybe worse than type 2 diabetes because it's a silent abnormality. So you don't know if you are or not pre-diabetic, you need a biochemical test, but you know if you are or not diabetes. And also the prevalence of uh, pre-diabetes, the people who know about the, this issue, say that it's about uh, nine, 900 million people. So much more, three times more than diabetic subjects. So our idea was to know if it's possible to reverse this pre-diabetic stage, thinking about if it's possible to prevent type 2 diabetes. So we designed a crossover feeding uh, clinical trials of four months uh, in each arm, uh, conducted in 40, um, 40 um, sorry, 54 pre-diabetic subjects, giving them by free, in this case, pistachio. Uh, 
57 grams of pistachio per day during four months. It's quite hard to do, but the people agreed to participate. So here you have the, the, the characteristics of diet, and I show you the most interesting results. Talking about plasma glucose, plasma insulin, and homo insulin resistance, what we found? So we found that in the pistachio arm, subjects decrease, significantly, dec significantly decrease plasma glucose, plan, plasma insulin, and homo insulin resistance. So there was an improvement in the pre-diabetic state. Also, we, find, we found a non-significant uh, improvement of uh, hemoglobin, uh, uh, hemoglobin A1C. The other question that came to our mind was, what are the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms, that could explain these findings? And we focus our interest in lymphocytes. Why lymphocytes? Because probably are one of the main triggers of inflammation. And as is widely accepted worldwide, is that type 2 diabetes has, is a chronic, we can say that it's a chronic uh, inflammatory status, as obesity use or cardiovascular disease is as well. So we analyze at, uh, um, at cellular level, we analyze the expression of different genes involved in glucose and insulin metabolism. For example, uh, the gene of uh, GLUT4 transporter, AL6 in this case is inflammatory, um, is an inflammatory uh, gene and resistin. And what we found was a significant differences between, again, those subjects uh, taking pistachio daily in comparison to those subjects free of finance. And these results were in line to those obtained when we analyze the glucose uptake at cellular levels. So lymphocytes, in this case, had, after pistachio uh, intervention, had a significant decrease in the consumption of glucose. What it means is that these lymphocytes were less hyperreactive. So they were less uh, pro-inflammatory. And just to finish my uh, session today, probably most of you agree with me if we say that regular consumption of nuts in general could have an important glucose and insulin lowering effect, especially a short term, but probably also we have some evidences at middle and long term. But I hope you agree as well that we need large, long term, high quality clinical trials in order to better understand the real role of nuts in the prevention of type 2 diabetes. And thank you very much for your attention. The topic that I was asked to present is here on the slide about uh, the management of obesity, diabetes, and cardiometabolic risk. I'm glad I focus on the first one because the second was already covered very nice by uh, Dr. Bullo, and probably the next speaker will cover also the third. But however, I'm going to uh, focus on that, particularly on the management. So these are the commercial support. Uh, I do have uh, grants from the California Water Commission and for the International Nut Council for many years. Is that which one? Okay. And the uh, results that I'm presenting here have been peer review. <laughs> this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, and this is the, the reason. Frequent nut consumption uh, has been related to the, with the prevention of heart disease. This is something that we published 25 years ago with the Adventist Health Study as the landmark paper that uh, put nuts on the stage. Uh, at the same time, 
with subsequent clinical trials that we started at Loma Linda and we're following many other centers around the world show that nuts have an improvement on the serum lipid profile of uh, the subjects, whether they are regular uh, blood lipids or they are uh, with dyslipemia. Here we have in a graphic form the four uh, studies that uh, were originally uh, published uh, relating uh, not with cardiovascular disease and all went in the same direction, all in an inverse relationship, in a, a dose-response relationship fashion. At the same time, we know uh, the beneficial effects of uh, uh, blood lipids and on a <coughs> pool analysis of 25 uh, studies uh, that we were able to get the data from all the original data, uh, we clearly shown that uh, not improve uh, regardless of the dosage and regardless of the type of nut, uh, dramatically the LDL cholesterol and in hypertroglycidemic subjects also lowers the triglycerides. So nuts uh, are high in total fat and therefore I perceive as fattening. Uh, subjects that have uh, diabetes or metabolic syndrome, uh, they tend to be obese. Therefore, I mean, the question is, uh, we as clinicians or public health officers recommending the consumption of nuts uh, to prevent heart disease or for the control of serum lipids, uh, are we going to make the subjects become obese and really uh, not having a benefit? So this is the relevant question uh, that has clinical and public health relevance. So let's uh, address the issue of nuts in the context of body weight and uh, obesity. Uh, prospective uh, cohort studies uh, have uh, the first one that was published uh, relating uh, the relationship of uh, eating nuts prospectively and changes in body weight was the SUN study in uh, Spain. Um, it was relatively a small epidemiological study as far as the number of subjects, but it found that uh, basically those that hardly ever eat nuts or occasionally there is no change. However, those that ate nuts two or more times per week, which is not very often, but it was probably uh, the highest uh, consumption of nuts in this particular core, uh, they had a significant decrease in weight. Again, this is not cross-sectional, this is prospectively. Uh, the same was for the risk of becoming overweight or obese. So this is the first evidence that we had prospectively that eating nuts seems, uh, at least frequently, what is not associated with increase of body weight, and if anything, seems lower of, of weight. So uh, these are uh, the results that uh, we have in a, in a world form. Subsequently, <coughs> Uh, the nurses health study data was analyzed also prospectively over eight years. And uh, it was found that uh, those that uh, eat nuts frequently have uh, a tendency to uh, gain less weight than those that uh, eat nuts less frequently. And at the same time, the risk of becoming obese uh, was clearly uh, lower. And you see at the bottom of this line, the risk uh, decreased uh, as the frequency of nut consumptions increase. Uh, so these are the results. The, the higher nut consumption was not associated with greater body weight. At the same time, it was associated with a slightly lower risk of weight gain and obesity. So it seems like incorporating nuts, at least in a prospective fashion in free living subjects, I mean, uh, doesn't uh, have any risk for obesity or for gaining weight uh, other than the one related with age, uh, more than those that choose not to consume nuts. A subsequent paper from uh, the Harvard group in which there were uh, uh, three cohorts, the ones that uh, they have, the Nurses Health Study 1, Nurses Health Study 2, and also the Physicians Health Study, uh, it show that uh, they look simultaneously, not at the effect of nuts, but simultaneously a bunch of many foods. And here we have on the top of this slide all the foods that <coughs> prospectively, after uh, years, four years of follow-up, um, one serving of each one of these foods, according to the typical American servings, uh, was corresponding uh, with increase or decrease of weight. And as you can see, uh, potato chips and potato fries, processed meats and processed meats, butter, 
all of these in the three cohorts, so in males and females and in different uh, age categories, all were related with increase in body weight. However, on the ones in the middle that are uh, the foods that uh, relate to lowering body weight after four years, the frequency of consumption of, uh, sorry, one serving of nuts uh, corresponds with lower uh, body weight uh, and also yogurt, fruits, and whole grains. So not only nuts per se, but when they are simultaneously adjusted for other uh, things in the diet, because uh, eating nuts may be associated with a specific uh, diet pattern, but I mean, when all the uh, foods are simultaneously put into the equation, it seems like on its own, independent than other uh, foods, nuts um, prospectively seems to be associated with um, less uh, body weight. <coughs> so, uh, the group of Dr. Salas and Bullo, I think, published uh, uh, two years ago a meta-analysis on the randomized clinical trials. There were most if not all of these studies were not done to test the effect of nuts on body weight. Those were the studies that were done uh, basically to test the effect on cardiovascular disease risk factors, serum lipids primarily, and then they reported body weight. So in short term, most of them randomized clinical trials. The weight was published and they did a meta-analysis meta relating uh, what is the uh, not rich diet versus the control diet, regardless what is the control diet, whether a healthy diet or unhealthy, the Mediterranean, the low fat, whatever. I mean, and these are the results. On the 31 papers published for which uh, body weight was reported, uh, they found that weight, uh, weight, uh, the mean weight was uh, different. And here we have uh, the analysis. And on all of them, there is a tendency in this particular uh, graphic is body weight, a tendency but not significantly uh, so lower uh, body weight. The same for uh, body mass index and the same for the waist circumference. And here we have the numerical numbers. So in general, I mean, there was um, a difference compared with the control diets. Diets enriched with nuts did not increase body weight, body mass index or waist circumference in controlled clinical trials. So not only did not, but there is a tendency uh, for a decrease. What do we know about nuts as a vital or important component of uh, weight loss diets? I'm going to present uh, three studies that uh, have uh, been published uh, um, on diets that were rich in nuts and what happens to the body weight in the context of uh, weight control. The first one was conducted uh, at Harvard, and uh, the, they were testing the effect of a Mediterranean diet, rich in olive oil and nuts, compared against a high carbohydrate diet, and, uh, or low fat diet, sorry. And uh, it was on 100 uh, subjects for a year and a half. And these are the results uh, as far as uh, body weight, BMI, and waist circumference. On the bottom of the slide, we have the not rich diet, Mediterranean diet, and all these parameters went down compared with baseline. However, on the low fat diet, these parameters tended to go up. Uh, we conducted one at Loma Linda uh, in the context of uh, persons uh, with uh, cardiometabolic risk that were obese, in which we gave a low uh, caloric diet, uh, or low uh, energy, uh, and one was um, with um, almonds, uh, with two to three ounces of uh, almonds, and the other one uh, was with high carbohydrates. Uh, that was the, the two type of diets. And as expected, since it was energy restricted, uh, both diets uh, over the course of the 24 um, weeks uh, lower the body weight. However, the one uh, region almonds significantly so more than the other one. Uh, this was a short term, it was not follow up. Uh, so here we have uh, the study, the supplemented with almonds in contrast to the high carbohydrates, uh, resulted in a decrease in BMI by 
So, in summary, these two previous studies uh, show that incorporating nuts in weight control diets um, is not associated with increasing body weight, if anything, uh, with a decrease and then better results than without nuts. There is another study that was published uh, uh, recently by Foster Group in which they tested the, the same thing with a larger uh, sample size, 125 overweight subjects, and they were uh, compared against uh, a standard control diet for lowering weight. It was uh, energy deficient, both diets, and immediately both diets decreased body weight, but more so the control diet than the almond diet. And after 18 months, so a year and a half uh, of follow-up, uh, the same tendency existed, but the difference between the two diets, I mean, uh, became non-significant. So we can see, based on uh, this study, that uh, a diet that uh, is hypocaloric, that incorporates almonds, uh, do get uh, a less decrease in body weight than a controlled diet, but over the course of uh, a, a less intensive follow-up of a year and a half, there was no difference between the two diets. However, the one with uh, almonds, I mean, had an improvement uh, in many cardiovascular disease parameters other than body weight. So, what do we know <coughs> about uh, the effect of nuts in diabetes? I'm going to go uh, fast for the sake of time and because it was already presented just by the previous speaker. We have here uh, a few epidemiological studies and we see that, um, except the physician's study, there was no relationship. When you select the, the ones for which are in women, we see that uh, there is a tendency to go down. So at least the epidemiological evidence seems to be in favor, uh, not totally demonstrated, that in females, um, eating nuts frequently uh, uh, tends uh, to reduce the risk of diabetes. Um, in a study published by the Harvard Group, in which uh, they did with the North scale study uh, a subsequent follow-up, they found that all the knots, walnut seems the one that have the strongest relationship as far as trying to uh, lower the risk of diabetes. Uh, and in the PREDIMED that has been already presented or mentioned here maybe 200 uh, times in, uh, today, uh, here we have the graphic as far as the accumulate, uh, accumulated incidence of diabetes uh, over five years, and the line in between is the one of the diet with nuts. Uh, there was a tendency to be lower, and it, at the end, the computation is an 18% less, but not significantly so, because the 95% confidence interval encompasses one. So uh, these are the uh, studies with, with large groups. On uh, a meta-analysis uh, of six studies published, here we have the graphic, uh, we have the same. It seems like in the meta-analysis, the results seem significant. So I would say, in general, the epidemiological evidence relating nuts and diabetes goes in the right direction. However, is not as consistent as it is with nuts and cardiovascular disease. So we can say with a high degree of certainty that nuts protect against cardiovascular disease, uh, and, but however, the degree of certainty for uh, diabetes is not so. Particularly for men, because there is very few studies done in men and doesn't seem to have the same effect that in women. Okay. Uh, and other aspects of the diabetes that are related more to the management, uh, we know that the effect of nodes on glycemic control and diabetes in a meta-analysis that uh, was published a couple of uh, last year, uh, in which 450 subjects were involved, uh, there was uh, computed uh, or assessed in this meta-analysis that there was a 20% significant decrease in hemoglobin A1C and in fasting uh, uh, blood glucose. However, the differences with uh, fasting insulin and HOMA were not significantly. And here we have the results in a uh, graphic form. Uh, so, what do we know about uh, NOTS and cardiometabolic risk? Just a few more minutes. What? Just a few more minutes. Four more? Okay. So, I'm going to go quick. So, uh, Basically, we uh, 
published a, a study on data from the Adventist Health Study that we did a new twist to the issue of nuts. We were trying to see if the effects of eating peanuts versus tree nuts, there was uh, any difference as far as the risk of metabolic syndrome and obesity. And here we have uh, these four uh, columns um, have is not a dose response, is uh, the first one, that is the, the one to your left, um, is the group of subjects that were low in both um, ground nuts, peanuts, and tree nuts, that is all the other nuts. And then the intermediate, they are uh, low in tree nuts but high in peanuts. The next one, the third one, is high in tree nuts but low in peanuts. And the fourth one is uh, high in tree nuts and low in peanuts. And it looks like uh, based on this graphic, that peanuts has a more reduced effect, a more neutral effect, but tree nuts is the driving force here as far as uh, metabolic syndrome and obesity. And this is confirmed why, in the same way, numerical way, we see that the effects according to the components of the metabolic syndrome, uh, they also have uh, this tendency. But the, the ones that have a greater impact is in abdominal obesity and it, uh, hypertriglyceridemia, with no significant changes in the other one. Uh, a systematic uh, uh, review uh, on this issue of, of the criteria for metabolic syndrome uh, done by the group here, uh, by Dr. Blanco Mejia, the first author, uh, found a tendency to lower all these components uh, and that is uh, all what I'm going to present as far as metabolic syndrome. So, uh, except for this uh, slide from the, that was presented this morning uh, on the PREDIMET uh, that shows that those that consume nuts um, have um, greater uh, ability to reduce, uh, um, oh, sorry, among uh, the odds ratio for uh, reversion of metabolic syndrome among subjects that had metabolic syndrome at baseline, I mean, is greater uh, compared with the control group. And the incidence of participants that didn't have metabolic syndrome is lower. So it looks like, uh, in, at least in the PREDIMET, there was a tendency, I mean, not have this, uh, I would say, dual good effect. For those that do not have metabolic syndrome, um, they have less risk to become uh, uh, with metabolic syndrome, and those that already have, they can reverse. Okay, what potential mechanisms? Okay, let's go for obesity. That is uh, the, the one uh, that I'm more relevant for this presentation. Is that why subjects with high fat, not diets, uh, in an exact caloric or higher uh, uh, energy intake, do not have, uh, do not weight gain, and sometimes even lose weight. Well, there are two mechanisms. Uh, there, sorry, there are several uh, potential explanations for that. One is reverse causation. Uh, another one is higher energy expenditure, uh, the enhanced satiety, uh, food displacement, and finally, incomplete absorption uh, from nuts. Uh, what is reverse causation? So subjects that are obese or have a tendency to become obese, they refrain from eating nuts. And those that do not have, they are not obese, I mean, they eat nuts. So this is probably one of the explanations in the epidemiologic studies. Uh, nuts may increase uh, resting energy expenditure, although this has not been done in all studies. The ones that we did at Loma Linda, we couldn't find, but other authors have found uh, higher energy expenditure after uh, a few weeks eating nuts. Nuts may enhance satiety and therefore also replace or displace energy from other foods. I do think this is the main mechanism to give an explanation. Given the high protein and high fat, they have satiety and people that eat nuts, whether in clinical trials or free living, I mean, displace uh, other foods. Here we have a bunch of uh, studies that has been reported in which the, and this is the percentage of food displacement. Besides that, a mechanism that was uh, proposed by us uh, more than 20 years ago is that nuts uh, may not uh, have all the energy in practical terms that is reported in the food composition tables. This has been developed by many groups, including the one here, and is basically that the, the nuts Although they are rich in energy, not all of the energy is absorbed. We reported, and others uh, many years ago, that the, in clinical trials, that the increase in fecal fat uh, excretion um, 
and comparing the control group with the not group. Uh, by the group here, Dr. Dr. Kendall, uh, they found that when in a dose response of almonds, when they were in the control group, that means it's the full dose of muffin, uh, and then compared with the half or high dosage, the energy in the feces is higher. So being the diets equal except for nuts, I mean, it looks like the nuts are responsible for the greater excretion of fat and energy in the feces. And this is partially, if not totally, related to the mastication. This study shows that the more chewing, uh, I mean, the less fat or less energy found in feces. So this has to do uh, with the cells that contain the, the fatty uh, nodules in, inside. So here we have to your left, one that has been digested and one that has not been uh, enough mastication, and you have intact cells. So. Other mechanisms for the uh, potential beneficial effects on diabetes or metabolic syndrome are related to the uh, nutrient composition that was presented before. So I'm just listing here the nutrients that uh, are uh, thinking to be related and many publications that has either studied that or related to this. And here we have uh, some of the studies that has been published as far as the effect of anti-inflammatory effect. Nuts may have an anti-inflammatory effect based on the results uh, being able to uh, lower uh, markers of inflammation in many uh, short-term clinical trials. So, in conclusion, epidemiological and clinical data indicate that the inclusion of nuts uh, into the diets pose little risk for weight gain and uh, support by the mechanistic studies that has been followed up afterwards. Not diets improve glycemic control parameters and reduce diabetes risk in women. Uh, not diets are associated with reduction of abdominal obesity in some studies and reversal of metabolic syndrome in the PREDIMET. And thus, it seems appropriate uh, to recommend the inclusion of nuts in diets that meet the energy. Thank you very much. Sheila was, was supposed to be giving this uh, presentation, but she had a last minute conflict, so Cyril asked me to step in uh, just a couple weeks ago. So I'm pleased to be sharing the work that I did. A lot of this work came from the, uh, my graduate training, so it's really what Sheila has been doing, but I was privileged to be a part of it. First, I want to start by saying that we have not received support from any of the specific sponsors of this program, but some of the studies that I'll be reviewing were supported in the form of investigator-initiated research grants to Dr. West at Penn State University. However, the sponsors were not involved in the study design, analysis, interpretation, or dissemination of the results. So let's get started. This audience is well familiar, well acquainted with the global perspective on diabetes and the related uh, burden of cardiovascular disease, so I'm not going to inundate you with more statistics. However, I am going to state that part of our challenge, especially for those of us in nutrition research, is that cardiovascular disease takes years to develop. And many of the studies that we do, particularly the efficacy controlled feeding studies, can't go on for years and years and years until we get hard outcomes. Also, not all of the patients who develop cardiovascular disease have the traditional risk profile. So what we really need are a way to assess short-term changes in cardiovascular risk that still have prognostic significance, but that we can see after small dietary changes to see if we're actually having a benefit. The traditional risk factors for diabetes are excuse me, for cardiovascular disease listed here, age, gender, male gender, older age, dyslipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, and smoking, show up in many people who have CVD, but not everybody. Even though this data is old, it's about 20 years old by now, um, at least 25% of individuals at this time did not have any of these risk factors at the time of their first coronary event. 
So what I'm going to focus on today are some of the more novel risk factors that we can use in nutrition studies to see if these short-term dietary changes have any other effects. I'm also going to explain some of the discrepancies that we may have seen in other literature. So let's start with ambulatory blood pressure. I've been surprised there actually hasn't been much talk about blood pressure today, particularly with regard to nuts. However, in 2011, uh, several colleagues here wrote a review of nuts, hypertension, endothelial function. And at the time, there had been about 20 studies that looked at clinical trials that looked at blood pressure and nut consumption. And they concluded that the results were mostly inconclusive. Most of them ended up being null. However, they also stated that at the time, there were no studies looking at ambulatory blood pressure. Now, all of us sitting here in the room are pretty stable. Our blood pressure is probably not moving around very much, except for me being up here. But all of our patients go through many different things during the day that causes their blood pressure to go up, down, move around. When we measure their blood pressure in the clinic, it just gives us a snapshot in not a very realistic environment of what their blood pressure is. And measuring blood pressure throughout the day can give us a better idea of what their blood pressure is really like, and it's also a better predictor of target organ damage than a clinic blood pressure reading. So for those of you who are, who are unfamiliar with this approach, it involves a patient wearing an ambulatory monitor on their arm attached to a small device that they wear on their hip, and it takes blood pressure readings about every 20 minutes throughout the day and a little, bit, little less frequently at night. In this example here, a great thing about blood, ambulatory blood pressure is it can differentiate between wake hours and sleeping hours. In this example, the blood pressure throughout the day is about 115 over 70. During the day, though, it's 116 over 75. And at night, we see an average blood pressure about 102 over 57. So this is a 12% drop in systolic blood pressure. This concept, known as dipping, is also an indicator of cardiovascular risk. What we want to see is people's blood pressure going down while they're sleeping. Their body's at rest. They're not supposed to be stressed out. In contrast, people who do not exhibit dipping, they don't have any of this drop, tend to have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, with regards to nuts and ambulatory blood pressure, again, at the time of the 2011 review, there were no studies looking at ambulatory blood pressure. But now, in 2014, there were actually three studies that were published on ambulatory blood pressure in nuts, including one from our group at Penn State. The first one was the cis diet study, which was discussed earlier this morning. And I want to point out that this is specifically done in metabolic syndrome, and this was done in a subset of the study. It was only in the Denmark site that they conducted this ambulatory monitoring procedure. They gave the, excuse me, in this study, they recommended the Nordic diet, which included some nuts, and they did do some supplementation with nuts. And they found that although baseline blood pressures were 125 over 76, they did not see any change in systolic blood pressure, but a significant drop in diastolic blood pressure and looking at the overall daily pattern. And most of that actually came from a drop during the day. There was no difference in the circadian patterns at night. The second study for the 201st time today is PREDIMED. And this one, um, you're all well familiar with that. In this specific sample, it did include about a third of the sample who were type 2 diabetes specifically. The rest were just in the risk factor group. And this one was 12 months long, so a bit longer than the Nordic diet study. And this one found a drop in both systolic and diastolic in their ambulatory monitoring, but no difference in the circadian pattern. So it was about similar throughout the day. Lastly, I want to present the, one of the studies that we did at Penn State. We refer to this as our pistachio diabetes study because it was testing the effects of pistachios in type 2 diabetes. This was also a subset of the study. And let me just mention that the PREDIMED ambulatory monitoring was only done at the Barcelona and Sevilla sites. It was not throughout the entire study as well. And ours, for the same, ours was also, our total sample size was 30, but we only got the ambulatory monitoring in two thirds of that, about 21 people, due to the availability of the monitors. Our study was a crossover controlled feeding, so in contrast to the other two, which were supplemental and dietary advice, we actually provided breakfast, lunch, dinner, everything to these participants. And we found a significant drop in systolic blood pressure, and most of that drop actually came from what happened overnight. 
So to summarize the ambulatory data, what we're seeing is all three studies that have been done in, on ambulatory blood pressure and nuts showed a drop in showed a drop in blood pressure. Now this is small, only about two to four millimeters of mercury. Keep in mind that most of these studies were short. Ours was the shortest at four weeks. PREDIMED was the longest at 12 months. But even a drop in blood pressure at this level on a population-wide scale, there have been reports that a two millimeter drop in blood pressure can re reduce cardiovascular or stroke mortality about, by about five to eight percent. And the drop that was seen in the Nordic diet, in the cis diet study of five millimeters of mercury in diastolic blood pressure is associated with a 22% drop in coronary heart disease mortality and also a 40% drop in stroke mortality. So again, these differences are small, but on a population level, just by integrating nuts, they could have potential public health implications. And I also want to point out that these ambulatory results differed from the clinic results that each of these studies reported. The pistachio study at Penn State, the cyst diet, and the overall study, all of them stated, both of them stated that there was no effect on clinic blood pressure. So if we had just stopped there, we would have concluded, like most of the other earlier studies, nuts don't affect, affect blood pressure. PREDIMED study did not have a significant effect on clinic systolic blood pressure. Clinic diastolic was reduced a little bit, but it was not nearly the, to the degree that we saw in this ambulatory monitoring. So in that sense, in doing future research on nuts and blood pressure, I'd strongly consider investigators to include ambulatory monitoring so they can get a better sense of what's going on. Along the same lines, let's delve into blood pressure a little bit more. We talk a lot about blood pressure, but blood pressure is defined by the underlying systemic hemodynamics, which get much less attention. Blood pressure is defined by the balance between total peripheral resistance or vascular resistance and cardiac output. Cardiac output, more specifically, is made up of heart rate and stroke volume. So when we see a change in blood pressure, it can be useful to understand what is it that's actually changing. Is peripheral vascular resistance going down? Is cardiac output going up? So that we can get an idea of what's going on more on the underlying level. In Dr. West's lab, we do this with a technique, a non-invasive technique called impedance cardiography. We, we place these mylar bands around the neck and around the abdomen, and we measure differences in, in impedance, in thoracic impedance every time the heart beats. With this me measure, we're able to estimate stroke volume. We use electrocardiograms to simultaneously cap or excuse me, measure heart rate. From that, we can, um, from that we can measure or calculate cardiac output. We also measure blood pressure with an external monitor and then back calculate total peripheral resistance. So this can give us a better idea of what's going on in the overall patient instead of just looking at the one blood pressure number. And in Dr. West's lab, we often do this both at rest and during mental stress tasks to give us a better idea of what may be going on in the external environment. Dr. West has run three different studies at Penn State with nuts using impedance cardiography, and they were all crossover controlled feeding studies. The first two, the walnut study and the pistachio dose study, were done in adults with high cholesterol, and the last one, the pistachio diabetes, again, was done in type 2 diabetes. I'm going to go over these a little quickly, um, just in the interest of time. You can see the details there while I'm talking. But the bottom line that I want to point out here is all three studies showed a significant reduction in total peripheral resistance. They all showed a significant increase in stroke volume and cardiac output, resulting in pretty much a non-significant change in overall blood pressure. So while our conclusions from this study is nuts, from these three studies collectively, is nuts don't change blood pressure, they do modify the underlying hemodynamics, so something is going on physiologically. Continuing in the line of vascular resistance, I want to talk a bit about endothelial function. It's been mentioned in a few of the talks. It's a concept that may not be um, very familiar with all of you. So the endothelium is the single layer of cells that lines the interior of the blood vessels. And it's very important for anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic, and vasodilatory functions in the body. Now we care most about endothelial dysfunction in the coronary arteries. We want to make sure that the heart is getting the oxygenated blood that it needs, that there's not blood clots, thrombus, any problems there. But it's very difficult to measure coronary endothelial dysfunction. Angiography is invasive, it's risky, and it's not suitable for routine use in the clinic or in the majority of the research studies that the nutrition scientists here conduct. 
An alternative is brachial flow mediated dilation. And this was first presented by David Sellermeyer back in the 90s, where it's a non-invasive procedure, I'll explain in more detail in a minute, that is able to look at endothelial function in the brachial artery. It correlates well with coronary endothelial dysfunction. It has prognostic significance in being able to differentiate who will and will not have a future event. But it can be technically challenging to do. As someone who's been involved in over 200 FMD tests during my graduate career, I can tell you it's, it's very intensive, there's a lot of labor involved, and it's difficult to be consistent from study to study. So a newer, potentially alternative method for measuring endothelial function is peripheral arterial tonometry, abbreviated PAT. This method is done digitally, so it's a probe that goes on the finger. Again, I'll show more details in a moment. And here the evidence is a bit more mixed. Some studies show that it is correlated with coronary endothelial function. Some say it is cor correlated with FMD, and others say not. What's most likely happening is it's evaluating, compared to FMD, it's evaluating distinct parts of the vasculature and distinct underlying functions. However, there has been at least one study that used it in an ambulatory clinic to predict future events. And what's appealing for researchers about this over FMD is that it is operator independent, it is very easily standardized between laboratories, and it is less labor intensive to conduct. For those of you who have not had the pleasure of administering FMD tests, I'm just going to briefly go through how this is done. First of all, we induce a flow stimulus by putting a blood pressure cuff on the forearm, usually on the fore lower forearm, inflating it to above systolic blood pressure to cut off all blood flow to the hand. We leave it inflated for five minutes, and then we release that blood flow, and the ischemia that resulted in the hand leads to a flow stimulus or a reactive hyperemia, increased blood flow, through the brachial artery. The endothelium in the brachial artery senses that increased blood flow, releases nitric oxide, which causes the underlying smooth muscle cells to relax or to dilate, and that's why we get dilation. So you can see here the artery is dilating. We use ultrasound to measure the, the diameter of the brachial artery. We do it right up on the forearm, up on the upper arm, and then we use an automated software that is able to detect the borders on the brachial artery, we can measure that both at rest or at baseline before we induce the occlusion and the hyperemia and then also afterwards. We measure the difference between the baseline and the peak. We use that to calculate percent FMD. The higher your percent, the more, the better your endothelial function. Now, briefly on peripheral arterial tonometry, the overall procedure, the overall concept is the same. And in Dr. West's lab, we actually do both of them simultaneously. We have the ultrasound on one arm and then the fingertip probes on the other arm, or excuse me, on both hands. And so we've got a control arm at the top, which is showing us um, what's happening on in happening in the arm that does not have the cuff occlusion. We've got these fingertip probes that have balloon-filled filled catheters that are able to pick up the pulsations in the finger every time the heart beats. And then we can see the difference here is at baseline, this is occlusion, and then we release that cuff and we see the reactive hyperemia and the increased amplitude. The calculation is here and it's multiplied by a baseline correction factor to give us the reactive hyperemia index kind of similar to FMD percent, a higher number indicates higher endothelial function. Now, let's get to the studies, now that you've understand the procedure. In, for, there have been more studies in FMD than in endopat, and in these populations that I'm listing here, healthy adults, those with high cholesterol, overweight or obesity, and metabolic syndrome, the studies have mostly been positive, more so with regard to walnuts and a few on pistachios and hazelnuts. The mixed nut study that's been done um, was not significant, and there may be more studies um, referring to these that I'm, or that have looked at these that I don't have included here, but for the most part, nuts and FMD is pretty positive. Endopat is not nearly as positive. In healthy adults or people with metabolic syndrome, walnuts, pistachios, and mixed nuts were all shown to not have any effect on reactive hyperemia index. Now, specific in people with type 2 diabetes, there have been two studies that have looked at endothelial function in type 2 diabetes, at least two that I'm aware of. 
One of them, the Walnut Study, was done by the Yale Group, and they looked at um, this was a free living study where walnuts were supplemented about 56 grams per day. And it was a crossover study lasting each period lasting eight weeks. And they measured FMD and they saw a significant improvement in FMD. So that matches some of the, early, some of the other studies in different populations that walnuts improve endothelial function measured by FMD. The second study was a pistachio study that was done by Cyril Kendall and his group here, which Sheila and I were fortunate to be collaborators on, and we led the um, endopat portion on it. And I'm sorry, no, wrong pistachio study. <laughs> so this, this is our pistachio diabetes study again, where um, we measured both FMD and endopat in our 30 adults with type 2 diabetes. This was, again, crossover controlled feeding, four weeks each. And we found no significant effect on either FMD or endopat. So mixed results there. And then I just want to briefly mention there are other ways of measuring endothelial function that are more easily done in larger cohort studies. And that is by looking at serum markers of endothelial activation or cellular adhesion molecules. But you can see, as I've just briefly summarized here, in both epidemiology and clinical trials, it's really mixed evidence. So it's not clear if nuts have a beneficial or um, no effect on these markers. All right, and just lastly, I want to briefly mention arterial stiffness. Arterial stiffness is another measure of vascular health that we're concerned about. The, basically, the problem with arterial stiffness is pulse waves travel through stiffer arteries faster than they travel through distensible arteries. Every time your heart beats, a pulse wave gets reflected out to the periphery of your body, and part of that pulse wave gets reflected back to your heart. In the absence of arterial stiffness, that reflection comes back during diastole, where it's able to boost diastolic pressure in the heart, and that's when the coronary muscle itself gets perfused with oxygenated blood. In the presence of stiff arteries, the initial pulse wave goes out faster, it comes back faster, and it hits the heart during systole. So it augments central systolic pressure and then can also lead to ischemia during diastole because that pulse wave came back too soon. We can measure arterial stiffness by looking at that augment, augmented pressure, so how much, central, how much systolic pressure is increased because of this incident wave. As you can imagine, a greater augmentation index indicates greater stiffness. An alternative way of looking at this is to measure pulse wave velocity, literally the speed at which the pulse waves travel through the body. It's most commonly done by measuring waves form at the carotid and femoral artery simultaneously, and then simply calculating out distance over time to get velocity. And again, a greater velocity indicates greater stiffness. I'm just gonna summarize these quick because we're just about done that um, there have been two studies that I'm aware of looking at nuts in arterial stiffness. Both of them were done with pistachios. One was done in India, and this one was the one that was done by Cyril Kendall's group here in Toronto. And um, the first one did find an increase. The study in India did find a reduction in pulse wave velocity, but we found no effect on using endopat in Cyril's study here. So evidence is still mixed, but this is relatively new technology, so it's not surprising. So just to summarize, there, are, there is emerging evidence that nuts can reduce ambulatory blood pressure, and this is particularly important because the clinic blood pressure readings have not been shown to be very strong. It may reduce total peripheral resistance, but there's a compensatory increase in cardiac output. And even there, it's hard to say which one came first. Are the nuts no lowering cardiac output or stroke volume, and TPR goes down, or TPR changes, or does it go the other way around, which one comes first? There is some indication that nuts can improve endothelial function, specifically when measured by flow-mediated dilation. I'm not going to go into the mechanisms. The previous speaker did a wonderful job of overviewing that. I'm just going to say that some of the mechanisms that um, have purportedly been involved in this would be the unsaturated fats, and specifically the magnesium and the potassium that may be lending to the vascular effects that we're seeing. So then I just want to close by acknowledging everyone that's been involved with the study and thank you for your time.
thank you for a kind introduction and uh, thank the organizer for giving us the opportunity to talk about our study and on behalf of my uh, collaborators in Taiwan. And so far today we have not talked about people kind of study from the Asia, so enjoy the, my uh, perspective about the Chinese and diabetes. My uh, disclosure and not disclose for the commercial support. And uh, we got the grant from the Open Board of California to consider the study. And however, the Open Board of California uh, was not involved in the study design and conduct and uh, data analysis or interpretation. So I want to talk about two studies. Uh, the first study uh, we, we conducted in about six years ago uh, in, in Taiwan. And it's a pilot study, small scale, and it's a, a crossover design study, uh, about 12 weeks. Uh, it's a control feeding, normalized uh, crossover, and uh, including the two week run in, uh, two week run out, and the four week of intervention. And the diet is the NCEP diet, is the control diet, and uh, replace the 20% uh, energy for almonds. And uh, uh, we have 20 subjects, uh, nine male, 11 females, and they're about 58 years old, and uh, a year of the diabetic duration. And they don't use uh, some kind of the uh, hyper hyperglycemia medication, but they don't use any of the insulin uh, to control their blood glucose. So the result from this trial, uh, we see the, the blood glucose, uh, it's decreased about uh, seven milligram per deciliter, about 40.5% reduction. It's computer control, the slight decrease, but not significant. And the incident, we also see the reduction, uh, about 8.1%, which is about one uh, micro unit per, per liter. And the control diet also de decreased a little bit. And so the, the difference between the control and the open diet is about uh, not so uh, big as the uh, blood glucose. So after we did the first study, uh, we are thinking about, uh, we need to do the one more study to uh, confirm the results we uh, attended from this study. Uh, especially we want to think about this uh, homoglobin A1C, uh, which is the home mark marker for the uh, glucose control. So the hypothesis for the study is, uh, when compared to kind of possible, possible and step, step to diet, the consumption of three grams of almonds per day uh, for three months, we will improve measures of the glucose regulation and the CBD risk factor. Our primary uh, outcome is the hemoglobin A1C, and secondary is uh, some other the, uh, blood glucose incident and the prosperandial glucose uh, tolerance. Uh, design is very similar to the first study. Uh, however, uh, the intervention the 12 weeks, and then in the run in and wash out, uh, Subjects also come from the diet we have provided to them. Uh, it's not so different from our first trial. And then we collect the, the blood urine uh, before and, and after the intervention phases. This is a diet, uh, this is a SEP2 diet, diet uh, this control. And the almond diet, we replace the 20% energy uh, from the control diet. The kind of diet is, to, is given to the control their body weight, so the body weight is maintained due to study for the all subjects. And then we create some of the recipes to incorporate the almond to the diet, especially we make some of the uh, steam bun and pizza and some kind of uh, the, maybe the noodle, to, so we can incorporate the, this the almond into the, their, the meals. So we give the, the almonds into the breakfast and also the, in the either lunch, uh, dinner or as a snack. So this is the nutrient composition for the two, two diets. Uh, the main thing here is, it's about uh, MUFA. Uh, the control diet is about 12, 13 grams. Uh, it's increased to the 31 grams. And the uh, dietary fibers increased from 16 to 22. And the uh, magnesium uh, increased a lot from 200 to 340. Vitamin E is about 7 to about 20 milligrams per day. And then the, the calories and protein are maintained uh, between the two diets. Uh, we we re uh, reviewed the med medical records from the, uh, about 10,000 people. Uh, they are patients in the two hospitals in Taipei City. And uh, we find out the, about 700 
730 patients are qualified for our study, and only 40 people are, are willing to um, participate in our trial. And the end of the study, uh, seven drop out uh, because of personal reasons. So total, we have studied three subjects. So this is the demographics and the baseline bra biochemistry for the, the subjects. They are about 56 years old and diabetic uh, history is about five years. And then they all use uh, some kind of the hypoglycemia medication and eight people use the, the statin uh, and uh, two people use uh, some medication to control the track stride, and eight people use the blood uh, hypertension medication. Nobody used the insulin. And the BMI is about 25.5, and I ought to point out to you that uh, this, the 20.5, is overweight in, in the Chinese. Uh, the overweight, the range, uh, the BMI range for overweight is from the 24 to the 26.9, so a little different from the Westerners. And a little bit of hypertension, uh, and fasting blood glucose about 140, it's a little lower than what we saw in the first study, which is about 155. And the insulin, the fasting insulin, uh, is also lower, it's about 11, the first study about 15. And hemoglobin one c about 7.5. And especially, I'm pointing out to you, it's about the, the cholesterol lipid profile. In the first study, uh, everybody has the, uh, increased the, the uh, cholesterol. Um, the average for the, the, sub, the subject is about uh, 230 for the total, total cholesterol and the 130 for the LDL cholesterol. But in this the study, we cannot recruit anybody with this uh, hypercholesterolemia because the, our government in the Taiwan changed the policy, a, especially for the people with the in risk for the cardiovascular disease, must control the blood cholesterol. So everybody must take some cholesterol uh, medication if they has a high cholesterol level. Let me show you the results for hemoglobin one c So when you look at the all three three subjects, we did not see any uh, effect on the hormone intervention. And so we did uh, some of the subsets data analysis. Uh, we look at the uh, hemoglobin one c smaller than 8%, uh, 27 subjects uh, under this uh, category. So we see the about uh, about uh, from the uh, 7.3 uh, to the 7.1, uh, the hemoglobin C about 0.3% uh, uh, reduction. So the percentage is about 3% reduction. So when we look at uh, the, the subject with the hemoglobin C between the 7 and 8, uh, it's not significant. Uh, there's a tendency there that the omen feeding can decrease the uh, hemoglobin C. For the people with the Hemoglobin in one is larger than eight percent. It's about six people. Uh, the omens has a neutral effect on the this hemoglobin one C. And then for the people with the better the uh, glucose control, there's a twelve subject. Uh, omen seems not have really uh, significant effect. Similarly, uh, we saw the similar effect on the fasting blood glucose, and you can see that the, there's no effects from all thirty-three subjects. But when we did the subject analysis, and we can see the about 60% reduction uh, between the uh, control and the uh, hormone intervention. And uh, then look at the uh, subject with the hemoglobin A1C between the seven and eight, and we can see the about 7% reduction in the uh, fasting blood glucose. We also did the, the, the glucose tolerance test, uh, and uh, we did not see any effect uh, the, when the subject uh, consumes the a standard breakfast, uh, and then we do not see any, any effect on this. The conclusion from my, my presentation, uh, omens are beneficial in glucose man management in Chinese patients with type 2 diabetes, uh, particularly in those who have a hemoglobin in one seed, uh, small than 8%. And uh, uh, when for the people with the uh, hemoglobin in larger than 8%, and there's the neutral effect. And uh, uh, we're almost to be more effective to improve the insulin sensitivity in the liver, but not the muscle, since we see the effect on the fasting uh, blood glucose, but not the prosperity of uh, glucose tolerance. So kind of question mark here, if almost is better to control uh, liver, uh, the, the insulin sensitivity in the liver, 
but in a scale of muscle. That time I won't question about it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for inviting me to Toronto and giving me the opportunity to talk about the guidelines and the nut consumption in Norway. The view you see here is uh, from the Hardanger Fjord. It's in from the tourist route Norway in a nutshell. Regarding the disclosure of commercial support, I have no conflicting interest to declare, but I am heavily dependent of my wife here, <laughs> outside our hut in Norway. I am also grateful that she has introduced me to this DNSG. The uh, objective of uh, my presentation is to evaluate trends in nut consumption in relation to dietary guidelines. In uh, 2011, the uh, Norwegian health authorities concluded that intake of nuts probably can decrease the risk of coronary heart disease. Eat a small handful. Uh, Eat a small handful of unsalted nuts daily was included in our dietary guidelines. It's a food-based dietary guidelines. This is approximately 140 grams per week or 20 grams per day. And it includes um, almonds and peanuts. Uh, from uh, 2015, packages of uh, unprocessed nuts can be uh, labeled with the uh, keyhole food symbol. It's a Scandinavian food symbol that indicates a healthier choice within a food group. I will use different kind of dietary statistics like uh, food balance sheets, household consumption service, the National Dietary Survey in 2010 and Norwegian Marketing Service in the presentation. Traditionally, nuts mainly have been eaten as snacks with drinks, uh, the nut bowl for Christmas or as extra provisions uh, during hiking. But uh, during the last year or so decade, it has been a more common food that is used in salads, casseroles, and breakfast cereals. The nut consumption has increased the last 20 years, both according to food balance sheets and to the household consumption service. And on average, is it as grams per person per day, it's between five and seven grams now. <coughs> the most common used nuts are uh, hazelnuts, walnuts, cashew nuts, almonds, and peanuts. And uh, the average nut consumption uh, contributes just for the small a proportion of the intake of uh, energy and uh, nutrients in the Norwegian diet. According to Household Consumption Service, it's uh, approximately 2% of the energy, and according to the National Dietary Service, it's 1.4% of the energy intake. And now I shall show some data from uh, marketing surveys, and it's uh, how uh, Many Norwegians eat nuts at least once a week. And uh, the nut consumption is split up into unsalted nuts and nut mixes and peanuts. 
And we see that there has been an increase in the proportion of wheat uh, unsalted nuts at least once a week from 2009 to 2013. And there has been a, a small increase for peanuts. And we look, uh, if we look at the characteristics of these uh, people who eat unsalted nuts and nut mixes, it's from the two years, 2009 and 2013, we see that women do this more often than men. The uh, older age groups do it more often than the younger age groups. And it's more common to you do it in the capital region and other region of the country. And it's more common among those with long compared to short education. If we look at the peanuts, the picture regarding characteristics of consumers is quite different. Here we see that the consumption is more common among men. And in other regions than the capital and among those with shorter compared to longer education. So maybe this indicates that eating peanuts is an old habit and that unsalted nuts and nut mixes is considered as a modern food at the Norwegian market. Anyhow, the majority of the population rarely consume nuts. Here is the distribution of different frequencies of consumption of unsalted nuts and nut mixes. If you see here, it's never or rarely, rarely it's approximately 30% who do this. And those who eat it three to 11 times per year or two to three times per month, it's approximately 50% of the responders. 13% do it weekly and 2% di daily. And we see that there is a tendency to, that this high frequency or higher consumption has increased from 2009 to 2013. Here is a short comparison with uh, our neighboring country, Sweden, and with the United States. The nut intake on average is at the same level in Sweden and, then, and uh, Norway. And the proportion of consumers during two 24-hour records here and four-day diet record was at the same level between 25 and 30 percent reported to consume nuts. However, in Haines, the proportion consuming nut products that day was around 40%. And it was just one 24-hour recall. So the proportion of consumers is much higher in the American survey. So what uh, do the uh, Norwegians believe about <coughs> nuts when we ask them what affects our health or your health? Do you believe we should eat more or less nuts? The majority say that we should eat more nuts, but a rather large proportion say we eat enough nuts. And this attitude has not changed during the last years. So there's a great potential for improvement. My conclusions is that nut consumption is increasing in Norway. A large proportion of the population rarely eat nuts, and the nut consumption is far from recommended levels. And uh, we will, I'm working in the Norwegian Directorate of Health, and we shall promote a healthy diet in, in Norway, and we will continue to recommend that nut, nuts are included in a healthy dietary pattern. Thank you. I'm going to ask the first question. 
Lars, after 15 years of presenting at the DNSG on health benefits of nuts, how influential have I been? <laughs> A lot influence. Yeah, I shall agree. I feel empowered. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. How much difference would it make if you included salted nuts in your, I guess I'm speaking to the, the last speaker, because I feel most nuts that are available that people are used to having are salted. And if we've excluded those from the equation, it's not reflective of how much nuts people are eating. In, in my personal opinion, I, I think it would be good, both with salted and unsalted nuts. But I think uh, unsalted nuts is better. Yeah, I'll just add, I think what's often forgotten is that we, have, we tend to have a very high sodium diet, or high salt diet, and so salted nuts are gonna just increase our sodium level, but they're also very high in potassium, as most plant-based foods are. And so as you increase your amount of plant-based foods in the diet, including nuts, I think your sodium intake could actually increase without effects on blood pressure. Let me add one other thing here. Actually, I have the same question, even I didn't almond research for 15 years. <coughs> And one day I kind of discussed about these the salt, salty nuts, almonds, and versus raw almonds. And then I heard actually the salt in the almonds the, is not very, very high. It's really kind of very slightly salted. So the content of the salt in the nuts will be you know, very small contribution to the diet. Angela Rivellese, Naples, Italy. Uh, one problem with uh, nuts consumption. Uh, maybe that uh, in real life people uh, eat uh, nuts uh, not uh, as a substitute to some other things, so some other foods, but in addition uh, to normal uh, eating patterns. So for what concern uh, uh, intervention studies, uh, there are intervention studies looking at the effects of uh, adding nuts and not nuts as a substitute of some other things, and uh, which are the effects on uh, glucose, uh, lipid metabolism, and so on. Uh, OK, if I understood uh, your uh, question is what the difference of uh, when nuts are incorporated into that in an isocaloric way versus when they are uh, as a supplement, OK? Uh, with respect to whatever outcome. That's my question to you. Are you interested in general for no, health? Especially on glucose and the metabolism. Okay. Um, also weight gain because you are talking about weight gain. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, nuts have a, a great uh, satiation, and um, as I show in my slides, um, subjects that in a free living uh, situation or recommended uh, by the physician or by health authorities eat nuts automatically decrease consumption of other foods. So there is uh, a quick displacement of, of other foods. So the total amount of extra calories is not as much as people may think. That's one aspect. The second aspect, as I mentioned, is that uh, the, not all the energy that is in the food composition tables is actually absorbed. So that makes the situation uh, that we have. Because in free living subjects, I mean, there is no increase in body weight. If anything, there is evidence to the contrary. Uh, the studies that uh, have been done typically in, in controlled clinical trials, uh, subjects are fed isocaloric diets, so in which some foods replace others. So there is not the situation that they are uh, in addition. So I'm not aware, maybe somebody here in the table knows of studies that have really tested the effect of having a regular diet plus nuts uh, in addition to and see the effects on, on these parameters. I'm not aware of any study. I just wanted to add uh, uh, several uh, studies that I read before. Um, so in terms of free living population, uh, adding, uh, whether adding uh, nuts as a snack or uh, including nuts in the uh, overall dietary pattern, I think um, so there are studies showing that uh, nuts have this satiety effect. So even in free living population, uh, you, in, whatever you, way you eat uh, nuts, 
um, you feel full very quickly. Um, so you uh, reduce uh, calorie intake from other uh, things, uh, possibly ca uh, carbohydrate, uh, those carbohydrate or uh, fat, uh, other uh, saturated fat, fatty acids. So in that sense, I think um, it probably uh, not uh, of a great concern um, to consume nuts as a snack or include in a dietary pattern because if nuts really have satiety effect, it, it, it doesn't matter. Was only one comment. One comment in relation to this: uh, in the meta-analysis that we have conducted, and uh, Joan Sabate has presented in relation to clinical trials on we body weight, we have uh, uh, conducted a sensitivity analysis in relation to those studies that nuts are added and those that substitute other foods, no? and in this case, uh, the results are the same. Hi, uh, my name is Erica. I'm coming from Women Health, Women Hands here in Toronto, and I have a question for the panel. Uh, did any of the studies measure um, changes in body composition when you're talking about weight, and less risk of uh, increased weight? Also, if there is any association with uh, glucose sensitivity and body composition. I know of some studies that have uh, measured um, central adiposity and uh, waist uh, circumference. And in these studies, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is a tendency to have a lower um, waist circumference compared with a controlled diet. As far as uh, studies that have used um, adiposity in other parts of the body, I don't remember why I'm not aware. The, the one study we did in Taiwan, with the, the first study we saw about maybe 0.5% uh, reduction in the, the body fat, uh, but second study, we did not see that. So it's still kind of uh, inconsistent in this regard. Yeah, Fred Brown's Maastricht University. Uh, I have two points. Uh, if I step in the shoes of the consumer again, uh, I hear that if I eat peanut butter, I excrete only 4% of the fat. If I eat the nuts, I excrete 17% of the fat. That means the more you swallow, the more fat you absorb. On the other hand, we say these nuts are full of good fatty acids. Now, in order to make those available, we should swallow the nuts. Uh, we should, uh, we, we should, we should uh, make them very fine to absorb. So that are two opposite directions that you can move. Now, if I want to be health, healthy, what should I do? Should I keep the, the nuts long in my mouth and, and, and really make them fine and, and uh, to make them bioavailable? Or should I just swallow them to excrete the fat? It looks like all the questions come to the center of the table. <laughs> in 1980, uh, there was a very clinical note published in New England that showing that uh, the, uh, the difference between uh, having um, peanut oil, peanut butter, or peanuts. And it showed that uh, the excretion or the intake, I mean, it really is according to the physical presentation of, of the food. Um, this is um, an interesting question, and I think it depends on the society and the social group that you are. Uh, I would present the message differently if I would be in, uh, uh, among the one billion people uh, in this world that go uh, to bed hungry. So I'm saying on subjects that have no access to enough energy and enough nutrients, I will highly recommend to either eat the nuts grounded or chew not 40 times, 60 times, so in order to absorb everything. In Western societies that uh, 30 to 40 percent of the energy is wasted, I mean, before even going into the mouth, and we are obsessed, I mean, with the total energy intake, it seems appropriate 
I mean, to say, and is perceived as positive, I mean, by the society, I'm not saying that it is, that some of the energy that you are actually enjoying, uh, I mean, is not absorbed. So it depends on the marketing message that you want to portray. Okay. Uh, now, oh, the other point. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh. I also wanted to add, uh, going back to the satiety effect I just talked about. So there are research showing that uh, chewing actually is a trigger uh, for the uh, adip uh, brain adipose that axis. So when you chew, you chew more and uh, uh, send signals to the brain. And the brain will uh, uh, like release all those hormones to reduce your uh, adipose tissue or like uh, the, the uh, absorption uh, to uh, store the uh, fat, fat, fats in your body. So uh, speaking from the uh, uh, brain adipose, this axis, the physiological uh, uh, circle, uh, I would uh, recommend chewing uh, so you will uh, uh, trigger this, uh, uh, this mechanism to reduce the uh, intake from other, uh, other uh, uh, less healthy uh, components in the diet. Okay. Now, if you, uh, that was the second point, if you excrete more fat with the nuts, you have more fecal fat. Is there anything known on uh, an effect of the fecal fat content on changing a microbiota and microbiota metabolism? That's a very interesting question. I don't think there is anything published on that, but it's urgently needed, I mean, to see the effects of the microbiota. Uh, as far as uh, not eaters versus non not eaters. Uh, and also a second step would be, I mean, relating that to the uh, chewing uh, aspects of, of that. I think there are two studies published yes. in the area uh, yes. from the baby bear uh, with the, uh, Dr. May in the University of Florida. They talk about uh, almonds and the pistachio. There is some kind of effect, especially from pistachio, there is some effect on the bacteria profile. Okay, in what, in what yeah. direction? And then the, in the one in vitro study in the almonds, they some the, use the in vitro uh, gut model, and they see some of the effects on the bacteria profile as well. Hello, I just want to tell that I just want to tell that uh, you are right. Uh, there are, I think, two uh, already published uh, articles in this in this sense, and in, for example, uh, regarding uh, pistachios, I know that the results were in the expected way. If we can say that. If we can say expected way, talking about microbiota, because we really don't know what microbiota is still doing in our intestine. So, uh, but uh, we have we know some films of microbiota, and in this case, the studies were, um, as, I, as I said before, in the expected way, meaning that uh, beneficial films were uh, increased in detrimental to the less beneficial. But it's not related with. Uh, um, fats in fecal samples is related probably with uh, is related with fats or fibers or uh, polyphenols that also are in, in, in the intestine. So it's a mix of uh, effects. Uh, I would one point about polyphenols. Uh, if you eat nuts, especially almonds, eat the whole almonds. Don't eat the silver uh, the one uh, without skin, because most of polyphenols are on the skin. So not they can maturate the, the uh, gut bacteria. Yeah, in some um, conditions, people have felt that um, ingestion of nuts, like peanuts, uh, has an effect on inhibiting um, food intake. You know, somehow um, it inhibits hunger pains. So uh, does anyone think that um, the reduction in body weight is associated with um, a reduction in food intake when one has taken a nuts like peanut. Uh, just um, I, I, I mentioned before, uh, so there are studies showing that nuts have this satiety effect. Uh, definitely you eat more and you feel full very quickly, so you reduce other uh, uh, calorie intake from other food components. And, uh, um, so, uh, in that sense, I think it's possible that we, in observational studies, we uh, didn't observe uh, a, 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 a positive association between nut intake and, uh, and obesity uh, and uh, weight gain. Um, it's, it's one of the mechanisms, I think, and the uh, satiety effect is definitely 
uh, uh, possible and probably play an important role in this uh, uh, lack of uh, association between nut intake and obesity, obesity and weight gain. Uh, there are uh, studies uh, doing uh, nuts and uh, uh, all those satiety hormones that the brain and, uh, release and adipose tissue release, for example, adiponectin, leptin, and insulin by pancreas, by, uh, in, in, secreted by pancreas, and also the uh, uh, satiety hormones released by the brain. Um, so, uh, but then, uh, as far as I know, there's no study uh, specifically uh, looking at the uh, whether these lack of association is mediated by the satiety hormones. But I think it's a very interesting area. And uh, I'm actually thinking of uh, doing a small trial and probably uh, propose to do something just like you said. And I hope that someone will fund me. <laughs> I, I think it's also difficult to isolate a single food. So you're looking, we're talking specifically about nuts here, but if you look, if you consider the earlier presentations today, so it's a vegetarian diet or the Mediterranean diet or a Nordic diet, these are all, the main constituents are plant-based whole foods. And so they're gonna be higher in fiber, which as Neil, was, Neil Bernard was talking about, would increase satiation, probably decrease food intake, lead to lower uh, body weights. Uh, and the same with the, the colonic effects. Whole foods, more of that is gonna get into the large bowel what happens with the microbiota is probably very important. It's a bit of a black box, pardon the pun, but it's, it's difficult to know exactly what's going on with the microbiota. But again, whole foods um, are probably going to improve the, the uh, colonic uh, bacteria profile. I think we should probably wrap it up. We're running out of time. Um, I'd like to thank all the, the speakers for some wonderful presentations. Thank the audience for your attention and your questions.